Hello, and welcome to this Shoreland Zoning Update. My name is Lynn Markham, and I am the Shoreland Specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension Center for Land Use Education, located at UW-Stevens Point. The Wisconsin Legislature has made many changes to Shoreland Zoning in the past year, and this three-part video summarizes the changes. This video includes three parts. The first part is an introduction to shoreland zoning and the recent changes to required shoreland lot sizes. The second part is changes to shoreland setbacks, vegetation protection, and impervious surfaces. And the third part is changes to standards for buildings that are located close to the shoreline. The purposes of shoreland zoning include to prevent and control water pollution, to protect spawning grounds, fish, and aquatic life, and to keep the trees, shrubs, and other plants along the shoreline that protect our lakes and streams. We've also learned that shoreland zoning standards protect property values. In lakes with less clear water, waterfront property values are lower. This comes in part from a study of over 1,200 waterfront properties in Minnesota that found when the water was less clear by three feet, waterfront property values around these lakes went down by tens of thousands to millions of dollars. What shoreland practices make water less clear? Rooftops on buildings and pavement close to the water cause increased runoff that carries pollutants to the lake or stream. We also see increased soil pollution and there's no shoreline buffer in place to filter the runoff before it enters the lake. We have shoreland zoning in Wisconsin to protect our lakes and rivers, which in turn protects our waterfront property values. Healthy shorelands with a lush mixture of native grasses, flowers, shrubs, and trees hold the soil in place, filter polluted runoff, and provide critical habitat for eagles, songbirds, loons, and more. The Wisconsin Constitution, created in 1848, says navigable waters are common highways and forever free. This led to our understanding that the waters of Wisconsin belong to all of the people of Wisconsin, which is the basis of the public trust doctrine. The state of Wisconsin has the obligation to protect the public's rights to make sure that our lakes and rivers are boatable, fishable, swimmable, and can be hunted on. When shoreland zoning was adopted in 1966 by the Wisconsin Legislature, it set minimum standards, and counties could adopt higher standards as they decided what was best for the lakes and rivers in their counties. Counties continued to make these decisions for over 35 years until 2015. We have seen many changes to shorelines since shoreland zoning was adopted in 1966. As shown on this graph, the number of homes along shorelines in northern Wisconsin has increased 216% since 1965. In addition to the increase in the number of homes, the size of homes and cottages has increased significantly, from modest cottages to larger homes that typically have a bigger impact on the lake. As a result of more homes and larger homes causing increased impacts to lakes, as well as new scientific research looking at how waterfront development affects lakes and fish, many counties adopted higher shoreland standards than the state minimums. Key components of shoreland zoning that protect lakes and rivers are minimum lot sizes, setbacks from the water, and shoreland buffers. As you see on this slide, larger lot sizes were adopted by 43 counties, larger shoreland setbacks by 25 counties, larger shoreland buffers by 13 counties, and impervious surface standards by 17 counties. In 2015, shoreland zoning in Wisconsin changed. The Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 55, the state budget bill, which stated counties can no longer have shoreland zoning standards that are more restrictive or higher than state standards for any of their lakes and streams. This means that the state minimum standards also became the state maximum standards. Act 55 also included other shoreland zoning changes and became effective July 14, 2015. Minimum lot sizes are part of shoreland zoning because they determine the number of homes, driveways, garages, and piers that will affect a lake or stream. 
Minimum lot sizes also allow adequate space on a lot to ensure that septic systems are not too close to drinking water wells or the lake. This photo shows 75 foot wide lots, slightly wider than the 65 foot lots currently required on sewered lakes. You see that when homes are placed on lots of this size, there isn't a lot of space between homes and the shoreline often becomes quite urbanized with few trees remaining to hold soil in place and provide wildlife habitat. In comparison, on larger lots where homes are spaced farther apart, the result is often a more natural, healthy shoreline. As an example of the effect of different minimum lot sizes, Round Lake is a small 80-acre lake. If homes are built on 300-foot wide lots around its entire shoreline, it will have 22 homes around it when it is completely developed. With current statewide shoreland standards, counties may not require lot sizes to be more than 100 feet wide on unsewered lots, which would allow 66 homes around the same lake as shown on this slide. On sewered lots, counties may not require lots to be more than 65 feet wide. 65 foot lots would result in 105 homes around the lake. Smaller lots and more homes on a lake results in more phosphorus running off into the lake. This is because many soils in Wisconsin have high levels of phosphorus even without any added fertilizer. You can see that the amount of phosphorus delivered to Round Lake increases from 4 pounds on an undeveloped lake to 18 pounds with homes on 300 foot lots to 27 pounds with homes built on 100 foot lots. What effect does phosphorus have when it is delivered to lakes? In 80% of Wisconsin lakes, adding phosphorus increases the amount of algae and aquatic plants that grow in the lake. Adding one pound of, one pound of phosphorus can result in up to 500 pounds of algae growth. So building homes on 100-foot lots compared to 300-foot lots adds an additional nine pounds of phosphorus each year, which can cause up to 4,500 pounds of additional algae. Phosphorus can also be recycled in a lake, so that one year's algae growth decomposes in the lake and feeds algae again the next year. As shown on this aerial photo where phosphorus was added to the part of the lake on the lower right, phosphorus results in more algae and vegetation growth, which can make it unpleasant for swimming. As this algae dies and decomposes, it can also lead to unpleasant odors and lower oxygen levels in the water. Some fish can't tolerate lower oxygen levels, so the result is more rough fish and fewer game fish. To wrap up this section about minimum lot sizes, let's consider the following points. 43 counties adopted larger shoreland minimum lot sizes prior to 2015 for some or all of their lakes and streams. Since the Wisconsin Legislature changed state law in July of 2015, Shoreland lot size standards are one size fits all statewide. The requirements are 20,000 square foot lots 100 feet wide on unsewered lakes and 10,000 square foot lots 65 feet wide on sewered lakes. Counties may no longer require larger lot sizes through shoreland zoning. Counties may require larger lots under general zoning or subdivision ordinances, but no longer under shoreland zoning. A shoreline buffer is where soil, trees, shrubs, and other plants along the shoreline are undisturbed. These plants hold the soil in place and filter the runoff to protect the water quality of the lake. They also provide habitat for eagles, songbirds, loons, and other animals. Trees from a buffer that fall in the lake provide preferred spawning areas for smallmouth and largemouth bass as well as perch. What happens when a shoreline buffer is cut down and replaced with lawn? The shoreline bank is destabilized and eroded. Soil washed into the lake contains phosphorus, which increases algae growth. Eroded soil also covers spawning beds, smothering fish eggs. Walleye and smallmouth bass are eliminated from lakes and streams when their spawning beds are covered in soil. Less shade leads to warmer water temperatures and the habitat needed by birds, frogs, and other wildlife is lost. You can see the difference here between native plants and bluegrass. Native plants have large root systems that are 5 to 15 feet deep. White pines and oaks have root systems between 6 and 10 feet deep. Because of their large root systems, they can hold a lot of soil and phosphorus in place, 
preventing it from eroding into lakes and streams. In contrast, the bluegrass commonly used for lawns has roots that are only one to two inches deep, so can't hold much soil in place. This graph shows what buffers can accomplish if they're big enough. The distance buffers need to extend back from the water's edge to accomplish certain goals depends on the soils and how steep the lot is. To keep nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen out of the lake, we need buffers between 13 and 141 feet deep, depending on the site. To keep fecal bacteria, that is bacteria from the poop of goose, dogs, or other animals out of the lake, we need buffers between 76 and 302 feet deep. A 35 foot buffer, shown by the red arrow, does not keep bacteria from poop out of the water. In many situations, it doesn't keep phosphorus and sediment out of the water and isn't enough for wildlife habitat. Multiple changes were made to buffer standards in 2015 and 2016 by the Wisconsin Legislature. Counties may no longer require buffers larger than 35 feet. 13 counties had buffers larger than 35 feet prior to 2015. The viewing corridor, which is the area where people can walk through to get to the water as well as view the water, was increased from 30 feet to 35 feet in every 100 feet of frontage. Also, the viewing corridor is allowed to run contiguously for the entire maximum width. A county shoreland ordinance may not require a person to establish a buffer on previously developed land or expand an existing buffer. Establishing a buffer can remain an option for mitigation purposes, and if a landowner applies to build an open-sided structure or gazebo closer to the water than the setback, statutes require a buffer to be established. Why do we have shoreline setbacks? These setbacks provide space for the shoreline buffer. They keep the shoreline buffer intact during and after home construction, so heavy equipment can come on the lake side of the home during construction without destroying the shoreland buffers. Setbacks also keep homes and other buildings on stable ground. Prior to 2015, 25 counties had larger setbacks for some or all of their lakes or streams. Shoreland setback standards are now one size fits all statewide. Counties may not require larger than a 75 foot setback. In addition, counties must use setback averaging to lesser setbacks, setbacks less than 75 feet, if two adjacent principal structures exist. Regarding shoreland setbacks, counties decide whether to use averaging to allow setbacks less than 75 feet when only one adjacent principal structure is less than 75 feet back, and they decide whether to use setback averaging to obtain setbacks greater than 75 feet if two adjacent principal structures required to be at a setback greater than 75 feet exist. Impervious surfaces are hard, man-made surfaces such as rooftops, driveways, roads, parking areas, and patios. With hard surfaces, rain and melting snow can no longer soak into the ground. This increases the amount of water that runs off the land, carrying pollutants to lakes and streams. Impervious surfaces also decrease the amount of rain and snow that becomes groundwater by soaking into the ground. This reduces the cool water entering lakes and streams during dry periods. On this slide, you see the results of a study of 47 warm water streams in Wisconsin. When the watershed, the area that drains to the stream, was less than 8% impervious, the researchers found a large number of fish and fish species. More impervious surfaces resulted in less fish. The same trend was found in a study of 164 Wisconsin lakes. When impervious surfaces were over 12%, crappies, perch, northern pike, and largemouth bass were eliminated. Current impervious surface standards allow impervious surfaces up to 15% on all lots and as high as 60% on some lots. Now, let's talk about why more impervious surface results in fewer fish. Impervious surfaces cause rain and snow to run off rather than soak into the ground and become our groundwater. Greater runoff from impervious surfaces lead to larger and more frequent floods during wet periods. 
The flip side is because the water runs off during storms, it doesn't soak into the ground. This leads to lower stream flows and warmer water temperatures during dry periods, which is hard on fish. Let's talk about a couple other reasons that more impervious surface results in less fish. As you know, a paved parking lot can get pretty hot on a summer day. When water runs off hot pavement or shingles, it makes the water in lakes and streams hotter for the fish. Runoff from impervious surfaces carries more nutrients from soil and fertilizers into our waters. This results in less oxygen in the water, which fish need to survive. Researchers have found that in watersheds with over 11% impervious surface, trout are gone. Similarly, northern pike are gone if the watershed gets above 12% impervious surface. Now, a few more reasons that impervious surface results in less fish. More sediments and algae growth make it difficult for predator fish that hunt by sight to find their food. In addition, sediments cover spawning beds of fish, such as walleye and smallmouth bass, depriving those eggs of the oxygen they need. Wisconsin loons are more likely to be found on lakes with clearer water. As shown in the graph, if the water clarity is less than five feet, the likelihood of finding loons is around 20%. Compared to if the water clarity is 20 feet or greater, the likelihood of having loons on a lake is over 70%. Here are the current impervious surface standards. All property owners may continue to keep their current level of impervious surfaces. And for new impervious surfaces in any residential area, 15% impervious is allowed without mitigation and 30% with mitigation. A new provision is that counties may allow higher percentages on highly developed shorelines. 30% impervious without mitigation and 40% with mitigation. Other new impervious surface standards is counties may allow higher percentages on lots with commercial, industrial, or business land uses. 40% impervious without mitigation and 60% with mitigation. In addition, impervious surfaces are not counted towards the percentage if the runoff from the impervious surface is treated by a device or system or discharge to an internally drained pervious area on or off site. As you can see, these impervious surface standards for residential and business uses are well above the 12% impervious where largemouth bass, northern pike, crappies, trout, and perch are eliminated. We've known for decades that the closer a home is to the shoreline, the greater impact it has on the lake or stream. The home shown here was built at the shoreline setback and has a shoreline buffer in place to filter runoff from the roof of the house and provide wildlife habitat. This home is built much closer to the shoreline. As a result, more pollutant carrying runoff enters the lake or stream because the rooftop is close to the water, so there is little time for the runoff to soak into the ground before it enters the water. There is little to no room for a shoreline buffer to hold the soil in place and filter fecal bacteria and nutrients out of runoff. And also there is less shoreline habitat for loons, eagles, frogs, and other animals. The red house shown in this diagram does not meet the shoreline setback because the whole house is not located 75 feet back from the ordinary high, high water mark. There are multiple reasons the house might be located at less than the shoreline setback. The red house could be a non-conforming structure. It could be a structure allowed at less than the setback by variance. It could be a structure allowed at less than the setback through setback averaging. Or it could be a structure that was built illegally without a permit. On the next few slides, I will discuss non-conforming structures and structures allowed at less than the shoreline setback by variances. Then I will describe the changes the Wisconsin Legislature made in 2015 and 2016 to the laws that apply to these structures. 
First, we'll look at nonconforming structures. In shoreland zoning, a nonconforming structure is a structure that was lawfully placed when constructed but does not comply with the current required setback from the ordinary high water mark. Regulating nonconforming structures has always been a careful balancing act between property rights of the owner to keep what they have and limiting expansion and rebuilding close closer to the water than is allowed today for new structures in order to maintain fairness and protect the lakes and rivers. Non-conforming principal structures have always been allowed unlimited maintenance and repair and sometimes limited expansion. Prior to 2015, if a non-conforming structure was destroyed by violent wind, vandalism, fire, flood, or infestation, state law made it clear that the structure could be rebuilt to the same size in the same location. When a non-conforming structure reached the end of its useful life and a new home was proposed, if there was room on the lot to build at the current shoreland setback, this was required, just like for other new homes. Structures may be allowed at less than the shoreland setback by variance if there is no building location on the lot that meets the setback. Shoreland variances are decided on a case-by-case -case basis by the County Zoning Board of Adjustment. The following changes were made in 2015 and 2016 by the Wisconsin Legislature. Non-conforming structures and structures located at less than the shoreland setback by variance can be replaced in their current location if the activity does not expand the footprint. Non-conforming structures and structures located at less than the shoreland setback by variance can also be expanded to 35 feet in height. No approval, fee, or mitigation is required through shoreland zoning for replacement of these structures or vertical expansion. A building permit, general zoning permit, or other permit may be needed, so property owners should check with the county zoning office. For many years, Wisconsin law has included a list of structures that are exempt from the 75-foot shoreland setback. In other words, they don't need to meet that setback. The list includes boathouses that are located above the ordinary high water mark, walkways, stairways, or rail systems necessary to access the shoreline, open-sided and screened structures such as gazebos that are located at least 35 feet back, broadcast signal receivers, utility transmission and distribution lines, poles, towers, well pump house covers, and privately owned wastewater treatment systems, specific fishing rafts, and recently in 2015 and 2016 were added to the list systems used to treat runoff from impervious surfaces and utilities authorized by DNR. These structures that are exempt from the 75 foot setback are represented by the red shapes shown on the slide. In 2015 and 2016, the Wisconsin Legislature made the following changes to structures exempt from the shoreland setback, which includes the full list on the previous slide and is represented by the red shapes shown here. All exempt structures may be replaced within their three-dimensional building envelope with no approval, fee, or mitigation through shoreland zoning. Counties must allow a boathouse above the ordinary high water mark on all waterfront lots. The roof of a flat boathouse may now be used as a deck, no sidewalls or screens. And counties may continue to set standards for the number of boathouses per lot and the square footage per boathouse. Starting in the mid-1990s, many counties started including mitigation in their shoreland ordinances in order to allow development flexibility in exchange for shoreland stewardship practices. Mitigation is proportional to the building project and it currently applies where property owners are exceeding minimum impervious surface standards and when there is lateral or sideways expansion or relocation of nonconforming structures. This thermometer is one way to represent a community's progress toward a goal. If a community's goals for their lake includes that it is fishable, swimmable, and has clear water, then regulations, including shoreland zoning, can help them move toward their goal. Other tools are needed to achieve their lake goals. 
1968, based on the Water Resource Act passed by the Wisconsin Legislature, the state of Wisconsin set minimum shoreland zoning standards. Counties were allowed to adopt higher standards if they chose. From 1968 to 2015, at least 43 counties adopted higher shoreland zoning standards for some or all of their lakes and streams. Counties typically adopted higher standards for the lakes and streams most sensitive to development, like small lakes and trout streams, while keeping the state minimum standards for their large lakes and flowages. In 2015, the Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 55, stating counties can no longer have shoreland zoning standards that are more restrictive or higher than the state standards for any of their lakes and streams. Act 55 also said setback averaging is required so structures can be built closer to the water, some impervious surfaces would no longer be counted toward the standard, and all non-conforming structures may be rebuilt at their current location and expanded up to 35 feet in height without shoreland zoning approval, fee, or mitigation. In 2016, the Wisconsin Legislature made further changes to shoreland zoning, allowing higher levels of impervious surfaces in more areas, allowing more structures close to the water to be rebuilt in their same location, and allowing structures built close to the water by variance to be expanded up to a height of 35 feet with no shoreland approval, fee, or mitigation. Let's take a minute to review some of the high points presented in these three short videos. We know from many scientific studies that the quality of a lake or river depends on what's happening on the land around it. We know that trees, shrubs, and native plants hold soil in place. When they're removed, there is more erosion that causes algae to grow and the water to be less clear, which results in lower waterfront property values. We also know that shoreland zoning can be a, an effective tool to protect lake health and fisheries. Whether shoreland zoning is effective depends on the specifics. How large are the waterfront lots? and how large are the shoreline buffers that filter runoff and provide habitat for birds and other wildlife. The larger these are, the more effective shoreland zoning is. How far are buildings and other hard surfaces that cause runoff set back from the water? The research has found that the closer they are to the water, the more impact they have on the lake or river. Shoreland zoning has a long history in Wisconsin. From 1968 until 2015, the state set minimum shoreland standards, and counties could set higher standards, tailored to their local lakes and streams. At least 43 counties adopted higher standards for some or all of their waters. In July of 2015, the Wisconsin Legislature set one-size-fits-all shoreland standards statewide. This means that the state minimum standards also became the state maximum standards. Counties are no longer allowed to have higher standards, such as larger lot sizes, setbacks from the water, or buffers. Waterfront property owners have a great responsibility for, and also a great investment in, a healthy future for Wisconsin lakes and rivers. Working together, we can preserve our legacy by protecting our shoreland areas. Each one of us, from the subdivision developer, to the lakefront property owner, to the recreational lake user, has an impact and an opportunity to help protect the future economy and quality of life in Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me for this Shoreland Zoning Update. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, Lynn Markham, at the email shown below.